Hey guys, Too Long Didn't Read Filmmaker here, and welcome to my start to finish tutorial series where I will walk you through various different types of setups. Now this video might look long, but it's actually broken up into two parts. The first part is step by step. I'm not going to really dive into too much of the technicalities here. And then the second part is the learning section. I'm going to answer a whole bunch of questions that I think might be coming my way, as well as going through a couple learning things as well. So if you want to watch the whole thing, grab yourself a cup of coffee and enjoy. If you only need the step by step, then just watch that part and be on your way. So without further ado, Tilder! Do you want to get started on YouTube, but you don't know how much to spend or what to do once you get everything? No problem! Today, I'm going to show you how you can literally get started with video quality like this for around 150 bucks. And this is what it looks like coming straight out of my iPhone. This is just the built-in video app. Around 400 bucks. And hey, this is what the Osmo Action looks like with this microphone going straight into it. Around 900 bucks. And hey guys, that is it. You've now learned how to go from start to finish. Key point. If you don't have the budget, don't spend all your money on a camera. That's the one major trap people fall for. Instead, focus on getting a bright light, a microphone, get it all set up correctly, and you can make any camera look and sound great. Let me show you how. Done, roll that intro. What's going on, everybody? You're watching Too Long Didn't Read Filmmaker, where the answers comes first, the reasons come last, but we're constantly and always still learning. So welcome to my start to finish tutorial series, where I'm going to basically walk you through various setups or various topics so that you get the information as fast as possible so you can get on your merry way. Now, this is part of my beginning content creator YouTube series, and I'm going to be walking through multiple different setups, and all of it's going to be compiled in this playlist right here. So check back if you don't see a specific one, because as I continue to grow this playlist, I might actually go over the setup you want. But if you don't see it, then definitely hit me up in the comments. Let me know what setup you would like me to walk you through. Okay, with all that out of the way, this step-by-step -step tutorial video is about the basic YouTube setup. And when I mean basic, I mean basic. We're really not going to go into a whole lot of advanced ideas here. This is just the bare minimum so that you can get started in creating your own YouTube videos right away. The basic setup is exactly what you're seeing right here. Basically, you're talking to the camera, you're talking to your audience. It's an extremely versatile setup. So it doesn't matter if you're doing an educational video, informational video, live streams, webinars, what have you, the basic setup will cover pretty much everything you need. When it comes to investing in your first basic YouTube kit, it can cost anywhere of just shy of $100 all the way up to $1,000. And the reason there's this huge range is because of all the different cameras that are out there. Now, a lot of people, especially beginners, will get fixated on wanting a good camera. And I'm here to tell you that is not the way to go about it. Instead, you should put a lot more emphasis on your light and your microphone first, because these two pieces of kit are going to follow you from camera to camera to camera. So don't be discouraged by just starting off with your smartphone. Your smartphone is more than capable, and I'll show you an example towards the end of the tutorial, but that way you can build up your channel, build up your presence, and then buy a better camera. If you spend all your budget on a good camera and not on your microphone and lights, and this is what your videos look like, if this is what your video and audio sounds like, even though you have this really awesome camera, especially the one that I'm using right now, well, it's not really going to do well for you for your channel. So my best advice is to not be fixated on the camera, get a good microphone, get a good light. We're going to go over some real great budget options here. So without further ado, let's go into our equipment list. All the gear and items you see in this video are going to be linked down in the description with my affiliate links. Now don't be alarmed if you suddenly see a completely different item, because as I continuously review gear year after year, my recommendations and the best bang for the buck is going to change. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to constantly update those links so that you are getting the best deal, and that way you don't have to go searching for a bunch of different reviews to determine which one's going to work for this specific setup. So. Again, don't be alarmed if you see something different down there. To set up your basic YouTube, we of course need a camera. Now I'm specifically going to be using the Sony ZV-1, which retails approximately $750. It's a great camera, but you don't necessarily need to use this one. You can go with something like the Osmo Action, which costs anywhere from $200 to $250. This is the action camera that I recommend because of its price point and because the additional audio adapter allows you to plug in a microphone and also keep the Osmo Action charged the entire time while you're filming. 
or if you really want to, you can even use your smartphone. Now, if you're going to be using a smartphone, you're going to want to make sure you purchase a tripod holder for your smartphone. Just make sure, if you're going to go with whatever different types of camera, that you purchase the correct SD card for that camera. Next, you're going to want a very basic tripod. You don't need anything terribly expensive. Somewhere around $30 or less will do. Next, you're going to need a very cheap softbox light, a softbox that has four sockets in it so that you could populate it with up to four LED bulbs. It's currently what I use for my YouTube setup. It's nice and cheap, and it does the job. You can, of course, purchase other lights like LED panels with their own softboxes. Just make sure that they do have the daylight capability and that their total output can go up to somewhere around 40 watts. Now, if your softbox does not come with a light stand, make sure you purchase a light stand to go with it. For the microphone, we're going to be using the Andy Cine M1 that I reviewed, and the reason is because it's a very cheap microphone at approximately $30, and it does not require a battery, so you're good to go once you plug it in. For the mic, we're going to need to purchase specifically a boom mic stand so that we can actually reach the microphone closer to our mouth. You're going to want to also purchase a ball head to attach to the boom arm, that way you can aim the microphone in any direction you please. Next, you're going to want a shielded extension mic cable. This is going to go from the microphone all the way down the boom arm all the way to your camera. The reason we're getting a shielded one is because we want to try to negate any chance of interference from radio waves. Last but not least, and this is completely optional, you can purchase a power strip with USB ports. This way, you can power your LED lights and pretty much any other gadget that might require a USB power source to keep things charged, like your smartphone. Even the Sony ZV-1 can be continuously charged with the USB plugged in. This just keeps everything tidy and neat without the need of USB power bricks. Now that you've got all your equipment, let's get started with setting everything up. First, find a spot where you would like to film and make sure you turn off all the lights and close all the curtains so that you're starting with a very dim room. For your principal light, you'll want to set this light at about 30 degrees to your left or right horizontally and about 45 degrees vertically aiming down at your face. You can of course play with this in various configurations to your liking. Using the tripod, set your camera lens at approximately eye level and tilt it downward slightly. The ZV-1 is capable of zooming in, so if you want to zoom in, you'll need to set the camera back further, but the light and microphone do not have to go with it. They just need to stay out of the shot. For the microphone, we're going to want it as close to your mouth as possible without entering into the shot. You can go from the top or bottom. It's really up to you. I usually go from the top. Use your shielded extension cable and route it along the microphone boom pole to your camera. The Andy City comes with two audio cables, so if you're going to be going into your camera, we're going to use the one that has the two black colored bands on both ends. So one end is going to go into the back of the microphone here, and then the other end goes into the extension cable, and that's it. Now if you're using the Osmo Action for your camera, then what we're going to do is we're going to open up this flap here to expose the ports. And what you're going to do is you're going to push this upwards. It feels like it's going to break, but it'll just snap right off. You're going to use this audio mic adapter and you're going to plug it in right here. And that gives us a mic port back here. And then same thing, we're going to use that double band cable here, the one with the two black color bands, and we're going to go ahead and plug it into the back of the microphone. And then the other end is going to go into the extension cable. And then the last part of the extension cable goes into the little adapter here. And there you go. Now, if you're going to be using your smartphone for a camera, then you're going to use the other Andy Cine cable, the one that has the three black bands on one end and two black bands on the other. So what you're going to do here is, is you're going to take the one with the three bands and you're going to plug it into your phone, whether it has a headphone port or through a USB little adapter. The two band is going to go into the extension cable here. And then the end of the extension cable is going to go into your Andy Cine microphone. And there you go. The first thing we need to do is set our camera into video mode, which is shown by a film strip icon usually. In this specific case, it's going to ask us what exposure mode we want. We want manual. There's stuff like shutter, aperture, and full auto. We, won't, we don't want that. We want manual so we have full control of what we're doing. Now, if you don't see this immediately on your camera, it's, chances are it's in the menu system. You just have to go into the video tab somewhere, and it's going to ask you what kind of exposure mode you want, and we want manual exposure. 
Now let's set up the file format that you're going to be filming in. On the Sony, we're going to go into the menus and go to the second tab. And on the first page, we'll see something called file format. Again, every camera has these settings somewhere. So you're just going to have to look for it depending on what camera you're using. So on the file format, in this Sony's case, we'll see something called HD, 4K, and then something called AVC HD. Some cameras have that. Don't worry about AVC HD, just concentrate on the other formats. And basically it's asking you, do you want 1080p or 4K? Honestly, 1080p is more than enough by today's standards and it'll give you a smaller file size, but you can shoot in 4K if you would like. Next, we're gonna choose the frame rate of what we're shooting in. You'll see the numbers 30p and 24p, or 30 frames a second, or 24 frames a second. Honestly, choose 30p. Some people will say choose 24p. It's really not necessary. That's probably only if you're gonna be shooting films. For YouTube and stuff like that on TV, 30p is more than enough. Lastly, we have the 100 megabits per second or 60 megabits per second, and this is basically pertinent to your video quality in terms of how much stuff is moving around in your scene. Pretty much for talking heads, 60 megabits per second is more than enough. You can shoot 100 if you want to. I personally shoot 60 because the only thing that's moving when I'm talking is my face. Now some cameras are gonna give you the option to shoot an 8-bit or 10-bit color space. The higher the bits, the more information and the larger the file size. When you're a beginner, you're, you can just shoot an 8-bit, the lowest one possible, because you're not gonna be doing something called color grading and color correcting all over the place. When you get to that part of your film career, then yes, shoot in 10-bit. Now let's set up your autofocus settings so that the camera keeps you in focus in your videos. When it comes down to it, Sony and Canon are hands down the best in the industry. Fujifilm is pretty good. Panasonic is getting better, but unfortunately, it's not reliable for these types of videos. So in the Sony, we're going to go down to the autofocus drive speed, and we're going to turn it to fast so that the focus motors move nice and quick. Then we're going to go to the tracking sensitivity, and we're going to set it to responsive. So again, no matter where we move, it's going to know, and it's going to keep us in focus. Now, depending on your camera, you might not have this option, but most of the newer ones do. And that's something called face eye detect. So basically, what we're going to tell the camera to do is to look for faces and for eyes. So that way, they specifically keep it in focus, which is a really awesome feature. Now, lastly, we got to make sure we actually turn on the autofocus. So we're going to go to focus mode and make sure you have continuous autofocus selected instead of manual focus. Lastly, we also want to tell the camera where should you concentrate. I usually use the zone feature and just put it right in the center because that's where my face is going to be. So when you set it like this, it's always going to look for a face right here. Now in terms of Sony cameras, they have this additional feature where if it gets too hot, it's gonna shut down the camera. Now the initial threshold at standard is way too, way too conservative. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna set it to high. And that way when we're recording in 4K for past five, 20 minutes, it's gonna allow us to keep going instead of freaking out that it's a little warm and then it's gonna shut off. Don't worry, pretty much everyone has tested this that it does not really damage the camera by any means. All right, we're almost done, I promise. So when it comes to camera settings, every camera has these basic settings. So don't worry, you don't have to purchase anything crazy expensive. So the first thing we're gonna change is our shutter speed. And it's located right here, looks kind of like a fraction. We're gonna change it down to 1 60th of a shutter speed. The reason we're doing this is because if you happen to have fluorescent lights around, you're not gonna get any weird strobing effects. Next, we're gonna change the aperture, which has the F moniker over here. And we're gonna start off at 2.8. Does not matter what camera you're using, 2.8 is a good starting point. If you have an action camera, there is no aperture because the lens already has a built-in set aperture. Lastly, we're gonna change the ISO. For the ISO, we're gonna go all the way down to the lowest possible. This is where we're gonna get the best image quality. However, if the lighting that you're using and does not give you the correct exposure, you can go up to approximately ISO 800 if needed be. Generally, every modern camera these days is gonna do really well between this range. Next, we're gonna choose a color profile in which to shoot in. If you've done your research, you've probably heard people talking about log and how that's gonna give you the best image quality possible. And while that is true, it is absolutely not necessary to do so. I don't actually shoot any of my videos in log. 
So on the Sony camera, we're just gonna go into the menu system. They actually call it creative styles instead of calling it picture profiles, but basically just figure out which one it is for your camera. And you're gonna see a couple different ones, standard, vivid, portrait, landscape, and so on and so forth. Honestly, if you just use the standard or natural profile, that's all you need. Now, specifically for me, I've actually turned the contrast down to negative two, as I think the standard looks way too harsh for the shadow transition to the highlights. And then I have the saturation at plus one, just to give me a little bit more color. And then these cameras these days are super sharp. So I actually just turn it down by negative two, and that seems to do a pretty good job. At the end of the day, these are just my recommendations. If you like the look of Vivid or Portrait for your videos, then go ahead and use it and go ahead and play around with the contrast, saturation, and sharpness and see what appeals to your eyes. There is no right way to do it, it's just whatever fits your style. Next, we want to set up our white balance. The reason is, if our white balance is not correct for the lights we're using, then you could either look really, really orange or look very, very blue or pretty much look wrong completely. Because we're gonna primarily use daylight colors coming from our lights, you can actually just set it to the sunlight icon and that will pretty much do a good job. But if you wanna take that extra step, then we can do something called a custom white balance. You will want to make sure you purchase a white balance card. That way you hold it where you're gonna be sitting. So whatever light that's gonna be hitting you is hitting the white balance card. And then inside your camera, you're just gonna grab a little snapshot of it. And then your camera understands that that is the white point. So therefore your colors will look nice and accurate. Next, we want to expose our face. Now, if you're going to be using the Sony camera specifically, it allows you to do something called zebras, and it goes all the way down to 50 IRE. Some other cameras do not go all the way down to this level, but the Sony does. So basically, what we're going to do is we're going to set it to 50 IRE, and I'm going to give it a margin of error of plus 5, which means my zebra range is going to go from 45 IRE to 55 IRE, and basically, if your face is in this spot, it's going to look nice and clean. With your light up at full blast, you're going to turn on your zebras and then go to where you're going to be standing or sitting for your YouTube video. At this point in time, if the light is too bright and your face looks really blown out, then what you can do is you can dim down the light until your face is filled with those zebra diagonal marks. Now, if it's too dark, then this is the time where you're going to pump up your ISO slowly but surely until your face is covered with those zebra stripe marks. Now, if your camera's zebra settings can't go down to 50 IRE, what you can do is use something called a histogram to ballpark it. So pretty much every camera has a display button here in the back, and you're going to click on it to kind of cycle through what it shows you on the screen. So as you click on it, we can see a couple different settings here, and eventually you'll see something like this, which is your histogram. At this point, Go ahead and sit where you're gonna be, make sure your light is set as bright as it possibly can, and then take the camera off the tripod and actually physically move it towards you until your face is basically populating most of the screen. Don't zoom in, just take the camera and bring it close to you. You don't need to be in focus. From here, you're gonna look at the histogram and adjust your lights or ISO until you see this bump go pretty much right in the middle of the histogram. Once you do this, your face is basically approximately at 50 IRE. Now we're gonna set the mic level, and basically you want this level as low as possible. But you need to make sure that when you're talking normally in your YouTube setup, your voice needs to hit somewhere around this mark, which is the negative 12 dB mark. And while this doesn't seem very loud, you're gonna make that up when you're editing. This is just a general guideline so that you have the best quality possible. All right, if you've decided to use something like the Osmo Action or any other type of action camera, here are your settings here. So what we can do is we can swipe up on the Osmo Action and that will give us our resolution as well as our frame rate. So frame rate, we basically will keep it at 30p. And resolution, you can do 4K or you can move it down to 1080p. There are some other additional resolutions like 2.7K or 720, but that's more for high speed stuff. And, you know, I really do think 1080p at 30 frames a second is more than enough, or if you want to, go ahead and go to 4K. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to change up our shutter speed and our ISO. Now the action camera does have an auto function, 
uh, and that basically the camera is going to determine the best setting to keep things exposed. I personally will always do manual because you're dialing in your YouTube set. So for the ISO, we don't have any third stop increments. We have full increments here at 100, 200, and 400. So turn it down to the lowest possible. But if you have to, you can go all the way up to 800 and still get a pretty good image quality. In terms of shutter speed, the exact same thing that we talked about before, you're going to want to drop it down to 1 60th of a shutter speed. Next, we're going to go into some other settings here. Now, we can choose our white balance, which is great. However, we can't do a custom white balance, and they don't have anything that says uh, daylight or tungsten. So those are the numbers down there for you. 56K approximately is daylight for sunlight. And if you are using tungsten lights, you can go down to 3200K. Next, we have color. You only have two modes, decently like and normal. Just stick to normal. Decently like as if you want to color grade your footage. Next, we have something called de-warp. Some uh, some action cameras do have these settings. If you turn it off, you're going to get that weird fisheye skateboarder effect. We're just going to turn it on so we don't have that. Lastly, we have something called format. And it's going to ask you if you want to film in MP4 or MOV. Generally speaking, always shoot in MP4 because it's universally compatible with pretty much every video editor, whether you're on a Windows computer or a Macintosh computer. To pull up the histogram on your Osmo Action, you'll unfortunately need to use the smartphone app called DJI Mimo. Simply download the app, and once you do, make sure you set up your Osmo Action. First, we're going to swipe down from the top of the Osmo Action, and that should bring up a menu. Tap on the screw nut icon, and then scroll down until you see wireless connection. Here you will find your password for the connection. Make sure that you also choose the 5.8 gigahertz Wi-Fi frequency for the fastest connection speed. Now go ahead and open up your smartphone app and wait for the app to search for the devices it recognizes. Click on the connect button and follow the prompts to join the camera. If you don't see the histogram already on the screen, you can find it by clicking the three dots on the bottom left and simply scroll through the menu and turn it on. And there you have it guys, everything is fully set up, ready to go, and your video will look like this, whether you're using something like a DSLR, a ZV-1, or even an action camera. So after you're done recording everything, we go into the editing phase. To import your videos, you could buy an SD card reader, but all you really actually need to do is simply turn on the camera and plug a USB cable between your camera into your computer. When it comes to the editing portion, you really don't need to go out and purchase an expensive video editor. Pretty much a free or basic video editor is going to do exactly what you need to get you started on YouTube. Because your primary purpose is to import the clips that you have already shot and assemble them into the timeline and maybe add some text, maybe add some B-roll, and then export it and then you're good. So let me show you what I mean. Let's say I love this talking clip and I like this talking point clip. However, in this clip, somewhere around here, I start rambling on. So basically what you're doing is you want to trim it down. You want to cut away what you don't want. There's two ways to usually do it. One is to actually use your cut or blade tool and simply select a point. And now I've divided the clip into two parts and can simply delete it. But another way you could do it is by simply dragging the one side and you can make a cut and trim just like that. And let's say I'm talking specifically about a product here, and I kind of go into this next part in the second clip. So what you can do is add something called a B-roll shot. So let's say I'm talking about this specific setup right here, and I'm simply just going to drag it and place it on the second level or on top of it. In which case, it's gonna, you're going to see me talk, 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 and suddenly it's going to shoot to this next thing. You're still going to hear me talk, and then it's going to come right back. When you do the B-roll shot, though, if you are making a bunch of noise, make sure you either import it just the video only, or if you can't do that with your editor, then simply just make sure that either the volume or the music is just non-existent. And then lastly, let's say you want to add some text or um, maybe just your name or something like that. So basically, same thing. Usually there's going to be a text editor of some kind that allows you to drag and drop something right here. And of course, you can just type in whatever you want, like TLDR Filmmaker. And if you can, you can place it wherever you want. 
Now the last thing that we need to talk about is the audio itself, because I specifically told you to record everything at negative 12 dB. Well, that's not necessarily the loudest for people to watch on YouTube. So this is really, really basic what I'm about to say. So all you really do is you go onto the clip that you want, or you could select multiples of them. And you're gonna go into your audio settings somewhere in your editor. And there's usually something called volume or gain. And the basic rule of thumb here is, is if you're basically at negative 12 dB when you're talking, you can just add plus six, and that will raise you to where you approximately need to be. You can actually go higher. Sometimes you can go up to eight or even 10, but what you don't want to do is start introducing a whole bunch of these red marks over here. If you see, if this whole thing is red, that means it's way, way too loud. So you need to drop that back down. Again, six is a good starting point, but usually eight will do. And therefore, everyone can hear you nice and easy. And when that's all said and done, usually there's going to be some spot up here in file. For Mac, it's called share, but sometimes you'll hear it called export. And basically from here, you're just going to send it off to YouTube. And sometimes they have a preset that's YouTube ready. You can do that. Otherwise, your basic thing you're trying to export is a video and the audio. And usually you're going to use H.264 for YouTube. And then you do have a choice of resolution sometimes. And in this case, since I have it in a 4K timeline, this is my 4K resolution. Once you get everything done, hit next and you're good to go. And hey guys, that is it. You've now learned how to go from start to finish to basically build up your first YouTube setup and also some basic editing. In fact, you're actually watching and listening to this setup right now. I'm not using my normal Sony a7S III, but rather this is the Sony ZV-1. I have my Andy Cine mic going straight into the camera, so that's what you're listening to. And of course, I have my one light source coming at me, and I am playing around with my background lights. If you want to use an action camera, this is what that will look like. And hey, this is what the Osmo Action looks like with this microphone going straight into it. It is a very, very wide field of view, but in some cases, it could be what you're looking for. And this is what it looks like coming straight out of my iPhone. This is just the built-in video app, and it actually does a really good job keeping my face in focus and figuring out what the adjustment is. The only thing that it doesn't do is, again, that whole audio thing. It's going to try to automatically determine what the best audio setting is. As long as you keep talking, it sounds great. And that concludes the tutorial portion of this video. And we're going to get to the question part in just a second. If you guys are not going to stick around, definitely leave a comment down below. Was this video helpful for you? Would you like me to break down other setups, maybe for cooking channels, a craft channel, what have you? Let me know down in the comments below. And of course, if you want to see those videos, go ahead and like and subscribe to this channel so that you are notified when I do release those videos. And last but not least, if you do use those affiliate links down below, this truly helps support the channel so I can continue making videos like this for you. So, the people that are sticking around for the questions, let's get to it. Can I use different lights? Yes, absolutely. There's a couple different types of lights that you can use. Here's just a basic LED panel with a square 12 by 12 softbox attached in front of it. And this is what that looks like. Here you have a four foot LED tube. And in this case, I have it mounted horizontally. This actually negates the need for a softbox because you're basically wrapping a lot of light around your face. So therefore the shadow is not gonna look as harsh. The main concept you want to understand is this. The larger the illuminated source that's pointing at your face, the easier it is to get a nice softer shadow. So let me give you an example here. If your light was the size of my thumb versus the light the size of my palm, the palm is going to be the one you want for a nice soft shadow. Because if you use something that's small, like a one single light bulb that's pointed at your face, you'll notice that my face has a really harsh shadow to it because the source is simply enough to try to wrap the light around my face. Could you use more than one light? Absolutely. There is a basic lighting setup called the three-point lighting system. Right now you're seeing more or less a two-point lighting system. The third light is actually over here, the one that's missing. And basically with a three-point lighting system, you have a lot of control. You have this big main light that's blasting most of the light onto your face. Then you have the second one that's going to try to fill in the shadows. So depending on the situation, maybe the lights are much further away, you'll want that second light so that you can soften the shadows. 
then that third light over there is going to be pointing at your head or your back or basically off to the side here with that green right now you can kind of see this green rim that's happening on my shoulder and neck and that's basically what the third lights job is but in this specific setup with how I showed you, you probably don't necessarily need a three-point lighting system. Maybe a two-point lighting is good enough. But if you do want to fill in that shadow, a very cheap way to do it is simply to get a poster board from Walmart, maybe 25 cents to 50 cents, attach it onto a light stand, and you simply place it in make sure it's not in the frame and have it angled in such a way so that the main light is bouncing at it and then it's going to reflect back at your face. When you do something like that, it's a very cheap way to achieve more or less a three-point light. Do I actually have to turn off all the lights in the room? Can I leave some of them on? Absolutely. The reason that I want you to turn off all the lights and pull down all the shades in the windows is because you need to see what you can do with the light that you have. After you've done that, you can start experimenting with opening up the curtains, maybe turning on a practical lamp in the back, what have you, and to see what it actually does to you when you're in front of the camera. So in this example, if I didn't want to do the three-point lighting with bouncing a reflector at my face, there was a window to my right. I could just simply open up the shades a little bit and therefore achieve more or less the same effect. Can I use wireless microphones instead of a wired microphone? And yes, you absolutely can, but the reason that I did not include it in this tutorial is because they are generally more expensive and you're adding in the extra element that you need to make sure it's charged at all times. When you're doing a talking head video like this, you're basically right near the camera. You're not super far away. You can go super far away, but you don't really necessarily have to. So that's why I chose this Andy Cine M1 specific mini shotgun mic because it doesn't require a battery and it picks up really, really good signals from your camera and also from your smartphone. So it's pretty much just plug and play. But if you do want to go with a wireless setup, there are a couple out there, but just know it's not really necessary. Could I just use a lavalier mic going into my smartphone instead of having to invest in that little micro shotgun microphone? And yes, this is definitely an option if you do not have enough cash or budget to purchase the shotgun microphone. Now, the reason I would prefer the mini shotgun microphone over the lavalier mic is because obviously the lavalier mic, you're going to have to wire it across wherever your camera is. And if you don't want the wire to show up on your shirt, you have to go under your shirt and then clip it. And if you suddenly run off without thinking, you're going to pull the whole camera off the off your setup. Basically, that's one way to go about it. It is the cheaper way, and yes, it does work. I did it for quite some time. But ultimately speaking, a lavalier mic does pick up a lot of noise around you. So if there's stuff going on outside, it's going to pick it up whereas a micro shotgun microphone is much more directional. So wherever you're pointing the microphone, it's gonna capture the sound right here the most. The sounds that are coming from the side or the back is gonna be more or less negated. You're not gonna hear it as much. So therefore, your voice is gonna come out much cleaner. But I totally understand. If you don't have the budget to get the boom arm, the microphone and stuff like that, go ahead and get yourself a TRRS LAV and start that way. It's better than nothing. And just make sure that you're going to be recording yourself in a pretty quiet room that's dead and doesn't have a lot of echo inside the room. When it comes to the built-in camera app for your iPhone or your Android phone, it will work, but everything is completely automatic, which is something that I'm not necessarily uh, fond of, but it does get the job done. The reason I'm not fond of it is because you don't know how the camera necessarily will interpret what's going on around you, even with a setup like this. It'll do, but maybe you don't want your face exposed that brightly, and you actually want the background to kind of have more pop. But if you have more light lights in the background, then your phone is going to do some weird thing where it's going to try to keep your face here and there. So basically, you don't have control. And your audio, your audio is another big one. Because you don't have control of your audio, the moment you stop speaking, it's going to think you're whispering and it's going to raise the levels up and you're going to hear that hiss sound coming in. We don't necessarily want that. We want absolute control. So 
If you want to, you can definitely start off with the built-in camera app, but I think for about $20 to $30, you can buy this really, really awesome app called Filmic Pro. I personally have not used it on a project, but it does give you the ability to change your audio levels so that you are always at the right level. You can change your shutter, you can change your ISO. Basically, you can turn your smartphone into a full-fledged camera, and therefore, you can make do for very, very cheap until you can invest in a specific camera for your YouTube. Should I shoot in 4K or 1080p? Which one? Honestly, in my opinion, and this is a very subjective opinion, I think you can do both. Both is not going to matter. And the reason I say that is, is because most of the time people are watching videos on their tablet or their smartphones. So it's a very small screen to begin with. So 1080 and 4K are going to look the same. But if you're watching it on a large screen TV, I personally have a 60 inch TV, very, very cheap. And even 1080 looks good because I'm not sitting right up against it. I'm sitting a few feet back. And basically TVs these days have their own little upscaling algorithm to make 1080p look pretty pretty sharp. So generally speaking, when I watch between a 1080 video versus a 4K video, the 4K might look a little bit sharper, but not to the point where I say there's a massive difference. So I will leave that up to you. The 1080p is going to be much easier on your computer or even your smartphone if you're editing in that case, and you won't have to deal with very large file sizes. But you can shoot in 4K as well. Honestly, it doesn't matter. What about different cameras? I'm hearing so much buzz about this Canon camera is the best, this Panasonic camera is the best, this Sony camera is the best, and it's $3,000, $2,000. Should I get those instead so that I get the best video quality? While yes, they might give you a much better quality, you're not necessarily buying it for the other features that's inside of there. So generally speaking, it doesn't matter if you're using the Osmo Action that I talked about, the Sony ZV-1 I talked about that are sub under $1,000, or even your smartphone. If you have a good light source and you go through the same settings that I talked about, keeping your ISO low and everything like that, you're going to get a good video out of the gate. The reason you would buy something much more expensive is because you need it for a completely different set of features. In this case, as a beginning YouTuber or even just a YouTuber at all, you just need video and audio. That's it. You don't really need a whole lot else. However, I will say this, if you do find yourself wanting to go to those cameras and your YouTube is part of your thing, I'm going to kind of lean you more towards either Canon or Sony, more so Sony, because of that good autofocus. I know it's a really hot debated topic depending on who you're talking about, but when it comes down to the brass tacks of everything, if you're going to be filming yourself and you're the only person that's doing the filming, you want autofocus that recognizes your face so that you can do whatever it is that you need to do to get the video you need. Why are you specifically recommending 30p for YouTube? Why not 24p? I heard 24p is more cinematic, so shouldn't that be good? Yes, technically speaking, 24p is more cinematic because that's what old films that you and I love are usually shot at. But when it comes to YouTube content, you don't necessarily need to have that cinematic motion because you're just talking to a camera. And most people are more used to seeing these type of videos being shot at 30p. Of course, that's completely up to you. Is there a benefit from either one? Not necessarily. The only time that I would say I want to shoot in 24p is when I'm actually filming a movie because there's certain camera movements that look better in 24p versus 30p. So that's why I'm saying as a YouTuber, you're not moving the camera all that much. And if you are, it's still going to be shot in such a way that people are more used to not seeing it in 24p. But again, completely up to you. I say 30p because it looks the cleanest. What about this log that I'm hearing that's going to give me the best dynamic range and also just the best video image quality? I'm here to say that while that is true, as a beginner, it's probably something completely out of what you need for a YouTube setup, and I don't necessarily recommend it. The reason is because a YouTube setup, you don't really need that kind of push and pull. I mean, it, it works, and you could definitely do something with it, but it's an extra step and you probably won't utilize it to its fullest degree. So even though I'm shooting in the natural profile right now, I could play with the colors here too. I don't need log to do it. So generally speaking, I would say keep log in the back of your mind 
when you start doing stuff like short films, narrative films, and you're starting to work with color grading, then sure, start looking at log. But other than that, I would say start with a standard or a natural profile so that you can get everything good right out of the gate and less work on your part. Will this setup work for live streaming and how do I do it? Well, that is a completely different video, but the long story short here is, Canon and Sony and Panasonic are now starting to work on certain apps at this moment in time where you could plug your camera through the USB port into your laptop or computer and use it as a webcam and therefore you can live stream right away. But it's still a little quirky at this time. So there are something called HDMI capture cards where you're gonna use the HDMI port out of your camera going into your computer and that way it can recognize it as a webcam that way. That is a completely different tutorial, but this is just to give you a gist that yes, you can use this for live stream abilities. Can the microphone show up in your video? Because I've seen other videos where the microphone is there. And again, this is actually just a complete uh, subjective opinion of what do you want. For me, generally speaking, I don't need to have the microphone in the shot because the microphone that I'm using is a shotgun mic. And it's only about eight inches away from my mouth. So if I have it closer, it's not gonna necessarily sound all that great. Eight inches sounds perfect for me. Now, to kind of dive in a little bit why you do see certain microphones, depending on the kind of talk show, if it's a podcast, you're using a nice condenser microphone or maybe even a really awesome dynamic microphone, then yeah, you kind of want those a little bit closer so you're not really brought you're not really talking loudly, you're just giving your voice and it can pick up those nuances when that microphone is that close. So generally speaking, it's completely up to you in terms of what you want to do. There is no right or wrong answer. For me personally, I just keep it clean and have my microphone just out of frame. And hey guys, that is it for this from start to finish tutorial video. If this video has been super helpful for you and enough to get you started on your YouTube journey, Awesome, I am so happy that this video has been helpful. And again, if you any of you guys use the affiliate links down below, it costs nothing extra to you, it just gives me a little commission so I can continue making videos like this for you. And if you have any questions or comments, go ahead and leave it down below. Maybe there's a specific setup that you want me to go over, just let me know and I will get to them as fast as I can. But until then, like, subscribe and share and I'll see you guys in the next one.